Good morning everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking about 3D image processing of uh, MRIs. There are very few places in the country uh, who do 3D MRI of the joints. We have been doing it for many years now. Um, and basically with 3D MRI, um, one can reorient the image um, in multiple planes and uh, also um, outline the structures along the long axis. Ideally, one should be imaging along the axis of the meniscus or the labrum or any of the soft tissue structures like tendons we are imaging. Uh, but because we are imaging the whole joint, then um, it becomes imperative on us that we outline these structures along the long axis using the kind of imaging we have here, which is 3D imaging. So in this 3D imaging, you can um, you can measure the meniscal tears, you can measure the labral tears, you can find small tears, and it's a volume imaging. So there's no partial voluming artifacts as you see on 2D imaging. The images are a little grainy because we are trying to acquire those 15 minute images into seven minutes or six minutes. Um, but they outline the structures, the fine structures we're looking at, the ligaments, the menisci, the labrum, pretty nicely. So today um, I'll show you uh, the 3D processing on three joints. Basically, we'll focus on three large joints, which is the hip, the shoulder, and the knee. And uh, we'll look at menisci, labrum, and cartilage, and different tendons. And uh, if there's a tear, then we'll try to measure that tear, and I'll show you how to measure that. And also, if there's a ligament tear, we'll look at the gap in that ligament tear um, during this processing. So let's check out the knee first. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with the knee joint, and this is a presentation I'm giving um, this year in RSNA, I gave last year also. Um, I'll show you a few slides, then we'll go through the processing, how it's done real time. So there are different types of 3D sequences. One could do an isotropic or isotropic, meaning same resolution in all three planes as acquired, not interpolated. And uh, that'll be isotropic versus an isotropic is easier to do where you can do say 0 0.6 by 0 0.6 and the other plane is like three millimeters. Um, we do isotropic so it can be reconstructed in any plane. That's the advantage of 3D imaging. And there are different ways uh, of doing it, whether you do gradient echo, steady state, spin echo, or Dixon or synthetic MRI. There are different ways of doing uh, 3D MRIs. But the most well accepted, as you can see from this slide, will be the 3D spin echo type. In this case, the spin echo type is a Siemens variant 3D space, which is this one. That's the true FISP, which is the balanced steady state. The 3D DES, uh, which is a combination of Han echo and spin echo. And then 3D PASIF. So you can get it in different ways. And you can see on the true FISP, there is some artifact in the bone marrow, and you don't know it's real edema or it's normal. And on the other sequences, you can see that area is normal. If you want to look at cartilage differentiation with the deeper layer being darker, superficial layer being whiter, uh, it's hard to appreciate that on DES. So that's why we prefer among all these sequences, the 3D space or the 3D TSE sequence. Now here is a case in point where you have a small area of chondromalacia, this red spot. And if you try to look for on those 3D imaging, it's hard to see on all these images except the 3D space, you can see a blister there the deeper layer of the cartilage where there is that white bubble. So it's easier to see on this. There are faster ways of doing 3D MRI. Here you have a bucket handle tear with the meniscus portion sitting in the intercondor notch. And now there's a new variant from Siemens, it's called Caprahina, which is based um, on this name, the Caprahina drink from Brazil. And uh, the same sequence, which was acquired as an isotropic, um, with a Caprahina is five minutes and isotropic is about seven minutes. And we have larger patients in Texas, a uh, number of them. So for them, um, trying to acquire 0.5 or 0.6 millimeter is harder, it, there's a big time penalty. So we are using 0.7 millimeter isotropic in all three planes. You can do the same thing for the shoulder and it's now possible at 1.5 Tesla also. This is one of our newer scanners, Sola from Siemens, is the Capri space acquired in about six minutes, and you can see there's a nice rotator cuff tear, and you can reconstruct that in any plane you want. So here it's reconstructed along the axis of the scapula, so you can see the supraspinatus coming down and not attaching to the greater tuberosity. There's a full thickness tear. Um, then the new uh, variant is the compressed sense, and this is from one of our Philips scanners. We have multiple vendors at our site, and this is without and with compressed sense, so there's about 40% time reduction in that and very similar resolution as we have without or with compressed sense. 
And now once we acquire these images, this can be reconstructed in all three planes. And here I'm trying to reconstruct it on this image along the medial meniscus. And now you can see on the axial image the whole medial meniscus as you wanted to see. So in terms of technical considerations, you can acquire sagittal or coronal depending upon less number of slices on either plane depending upon the knee shape. You can keep a voxel of 0.65 to 0.7 millimeters to keep the time below 7 minutes. Um, fat suppression is ideal because we are looking at fat suppressed images uh, to differentiate the cartilage from the fluid and the meniscus from the other structures. Uh, it increases the dynamic range of contrast so tears are most conspicuous on the fat suppressed images. And you can use compressed sense if it's available or at least Caprina and then reconstruct in all three planes and use the best scanners you have whether it's 3 Tesla scanner or the newer 1.5 Tesla scanner. So you can acquire it as non-fat set, uh, proton density imaging also again the TR time is about 1100 to 1200 and the echo time for most cases is about um, anywhere from 38 to 45 milliseconds. You can put the drive equilibrium to make the fluid white which you have done in this case and that gives you a good differentiation of bone to the cartilage to the fluid. So you can get good differentiation. And you can also use these images because these are volume rendered images to uh, deconstruct bone uh, from these MR scans. So this is not from the CT scan, this is from this MR scan. And you can also add patella to that and view it in different planes as you may do with a CT scan. <clears throat> and on these bone modelings you can do the measurements as you do with the CT scans or plane films and measurements are pretty similar as you have done some studies with them. And this is some of our literature, uh, you can read it online. Now we have done these meniscus specific reconstructions and measured the normal menisci, found the medial meniscus to be larger than lateral um, and then males usually have larger menisci or people who have longer height have larger menisci. Um, and then now Isakos grading is possible. Isakos grading was developed for arthroscopy and in that meniscus measurements are there. The zonal anatomy has to be defined. Outer zone is 1, intermediate is 2 and inner zone is 3 and then different portions of the menisci as they're involved in different types of tears. So this is Isakos grading. You can read papers about that. But basically here I'm showing you these meniscal tears in the axial planes as the arthroscopy sees. So here is a peripheral longitudinal tear. It is colored here as blue and the orange one is a normal meniscus. You can actually measure the length of the meniscal tear on these MRs. And what we have found is the length of the meniscal tears are longer on MRI as compared to surgery. Here is a big bucket handle tear with displacement into the intercondylar notch. You can see the big fragment there also on arthroscopy. And again, you can see this is a normal meniscus. And from here, the edges are missing. And then it's completely missing here with tiny fragment of the meniscus left. And most of the meniscus is sitting here folded in the intercondylar notch. Here is another bucket handle tear on this side and a longitudinal tear on the other side. So usually the one with the fat is the larger side, is the medial side. This is the lateral side which is the smaller meniscus. So you can see the peripheral longitudinal tear of the lateral meniscus and a bucket handle tear displaced on the medial meniscus. The radial tears are quite small. You can see this tiny tear there. And here you can see on the arthroscopy. These are along the radius of the meniscus. The horizontal tears are like that with fraying of the edges, small flap component. So these are horizontal tears. That's how they appear on the axial images, you can see this sort of blurring of the edges, expanded meniscus, <clears throat> and it all has mixoid degeneration and fraying of the margins. That's how it appears on the arthroscopy. Now, apart from menisci, you can also do cruciate ligament reconstruction. So again, this is the medial side. You have the anteromedial bundle, the postolateral bundle. These join together, and they kind of unite at the uh, femoral condyle attachment. You can see it in different planes. Sorry, let me take that away. Uh, <clears throat> and here you can see this is the ACL and we are not seeing the mid portion. Why are we not seeing the mid portion? Because it's all torn. There's nothing in between. So there's a disrupted ACL. And similarly with PCLs, you can see these small tears right at the attachment, at the tibial attachment, you're seeing a tear. And again, you can reconstruct along those planes. So these ligaments are beautifully seen on uh, 3D images. So here are the smaller ligaments. So this one is a meniscofibular ligament. 
this is a popliteofibular ligament. You can also see um, on the coronal images, here is a popliteofibular ligament. And then here you can see the injury to that. So, um, this is a bone fragment which is avulsed, there is a popliteus tendon attached to that and then this is the popliteofibular ligament. You can see it is quite thick and frayed and it is attached to that popliteus tendon. The other accessory ligaments like arcuate ligaments you see best on axial. So, this is a medial band, that is a lateral band and you can see the lateral band is torn both on the non-fat sat and fat sat images. Again, these are 3D images, you can see the meniscus, it is ok, that is the popliteus tendon, this is the arcuate ligament which is injured. And then if you are looking at things like iliotibial band, these are easy to see on the 2D images, they are slightly thickened but harder to appreciate any abnormality. While if you look on the 3D images, first of all it looks quite thick. And here is the fibulocollateral ligament in the back and this is in the front, the iliotibial band. See how thick and broad it is. So, this was a case of iliotibial friction syndrome and you can see the marker where the patient is experiencing pain. And that is pretty nicely seen on 3D images. You can also see hyaline cartilage. Um, these are 2D images I am showing you. So, you can appreciate the difference. So, here there is a grade 4 defect with some bone marrow edema. And you can sort of see it on the axial images. On the 3D, it is much sharper, it is a well shouldered defect, quite big and here it is becoming with obtuse angles. So, some degeneration there, this is more like acute stuff. And if you reconstruct along those three planes going forward, you can actually measure the extent of the meniscal tear, it is called a puddle sign, which is where the menis, uh, the sorry, the cartilage is damaged. You can see this defect and you can measure it. So, this is how um, it looked on uh, arthroscopy before and after treatment, there was a posterior root tear which was being repaired and this is the area where the uh, hyaline cartilage damage was and this was after it was shaved partially. And then microfracture was done and a uh, patient presented with persistent pain and you can see um, much of the area looks better now, but there is still a cartilage flap with fluid cleft extending underneath the menisc uh, underneath the cartilage uh, with quite a bit of bone marrow edema and there is a bone irregularity where the drilling was done. So, he is doing uh, partly ok, but partly there is a flap still hanging off. So, here I have loaded a knee uh, and this is a young knee, one of the examples I showed you in the presentation and um, this is how it is loaded and you can see it is fairly isotropic in all three planes. So, now first we want to see the medial meniscus. So, here I bring it on the medium meniscus which is this side the thicker fat and then I can angle along that. So, this one was acquired as um, non-fat set and here you can see it is hard to appreciate tears on that. So, that is why we do most of them fat set, but I am showing you the other example. So, here you can see the medium meniscus um, all the way you can see it and similarly now it has some degeneration that is why it looks a little grayish. This is a lateral meniscus now. So, if we outline along the lateral meniscus, I am just adjusting its axis. So, now this is a lateral meniscus and basically um, it has a small tear, this tiny thing. So, if I change the windowing a little bit, you might see it better. So, it has a small radial tear there. So, that is the lateral meniscus. Now, if I want to see the ACL and PCL, basically I will have to outline along that bring it this way. And then you find the ACL here, which is basically that structure. And uh, ideally you want to reset it, start where the ACL is. So, this way. and then you want to bring it along that. So, now if you magnify that, so this is your ACL and you can see the anteromedial bundle, the postsolar bundle and they are uniting with each other and going and attaching. So, that is your ACL right there. So, you can magnify it and then take some pictures as you may want to. So, that is the ACL. Now, in order to get the PCL, you do the same thing. You basically go along the PCL and then bring it here that is where the PCL is. And you can rotate any way you want. You basically have to outline and see whether you see the PCL, the two directions. So, here is a PCL going from top to down 
and then here is a PCL going from femur to tibia. So again, if there's a tear or something, you will see the break in the connection. So that's how you will evaluate the knee. Again, this is a non-fat sat, but ideally you should you want to do it in a fat sat plane, so then you will see the tears better as I showed you in the presentation. So now we'll be evaluating the shoulder, and you can see the way it's acquired, um, it may not be the true axis of the shoulder and the femur, the humerus is internally rotated. So it's kind of hard to see. So in these cases, you can orient along the scapula. So I'm going to reorient, so this way. I'm going to reorient here and along the glenoid. So once you have that, then I can rotate here too. So now you have the shoulder which is oriented in the right plane. So here it's less tech dependent and you can basically see the shoulder in the anatomic axis. And you guys see the labral tear, it's a big labral tear. So labral tears are really nicely seen on 3D with this white spots of fluid into the labrum. And you can see it extends all the way here. So it's anterosuperior going all the way superior and then going posterosuperior. So this is like the type 2C slap lesion all the way anterior. Now, if you just saw this, you may question whether it's a it's a sublabral foramen or a sulcus because it's so smooth and all that, but the labrum is so irregular here. And then all the way down, and you see the fluid cleft, which is more than a couple of millimeters that you won't see with the sulcus. And then you can evaluate the cuff also. So here's a biceps tendon going there. So, you know, the horizontal portion is the hardest part to see on these um, uh, 2D images. So in order to see that, you can actually bring it closer to the horizontal part, make it straighter like that. And then if you scroll through these images, you can see this is the horizontal part coming in into the labrum. So here's the horizontal part, which is abnormal. And now you can rotate it in any way you want to see that horizontal part again. So here, if I show you this one, I'll have to rotate this way. You can see this is the horizontal part coming in. So basically it's isotropic imaging, <clears throat> which can be rotated any plane. So the longitudinal portion is okay. The genu is mildly abnormal and the horizontal part is quite thick, dendrotic which will help the surgeon in making decision about tenodesis and all that. So this is about shoulder processing. So again, any way you want to reorient, you can. You can look at infraspinatus, it's here. You can look at teres minor, come anterior, and look at the supraspinatus. You can look at all the fibers. So here are the two layers, the tight fibers of the bursal side, and then the loose fibers of the articular side. You can see them, whether both of them are attaching or not. And here you can see there's a little defect in the loose fiber, so that's a small tear there. And then there's additional small tear at the attachment. So you can find all these tears by looking at the 3D images. Okay, so next we'll move to the hip. Okay, so this is the final joint we're gonna to see today, and this is the hip joint. And we've done 3D imaging, again, 3D spare imaging, 0.7 millimeter isotropic, and um, so first, we'll start evaluating with the coronal image, and you guys can see the cartilage. And then there's a lesion in the femoral head, this big lesion, which is collapsing the head. You can see sort of a fracture there. So that's an AVN, FICAT stage 3. You can also see quite a bit of synovial thickening here along the inferior plica. So plica, etc. are very nicely seen on 3D. And then this is the ligamentum teres, you can see. That's the cartilage. Uh, which is sort of normal thickness, and then that's the labrum. So you guys can see multiple slices, cartilage and labrum and everything. Now this is the area where we are focusing on tears. Is that a tear? So <clears throat> what we have to do is first go here, orient along that, which is that, and then this is a place, and then orient along that. So you guys can see that this is pretty nicely seen. Actually, you can measure the tear from here to here. That's the anterosuperior labral tear. It's about one to two o'clock position. Again, 12 o'clock is superior. Three o'clock is always anterior. Nine o'clock is posterior for every hip. And six o'clock is inferior. So that's about one to two o'clock tear. You can see this labral tear. Now, in order to see that tear in another plane, you can actually go along the axis of the plane right here. And then if you look at 
on the sagittal images. So here is the stabular cartilage, the femoral cartilage and then as you follow this, the tear is here which is harder to see. So how can you make it better? Well, do a reset and then come here again, that's the place we are looking at. And then this is how the labrum is going. And this is the orientation of the labrum, like that. So, at some point, sometimes you can see it here, but there's partial voluming with fluid, so it could be harder to see. But if you come here, you can see this is a normal labrum, but after that, if I'm gonna scroll, as I scroll through the labrum, here the inferior edge is missing. And as I scroll through more, it's missing here. So that's basically all the labral tear we were seeing. And then when you come here, at this point the labrum looks okay. So basically it's from here where you see the cleft in the labrum to all the way there. So it's about one to two o'clock what we saw on the other image. So you can actually see multiple labral tears, you can measure the labral tears. In this case, you know, the, this hip will get replaced. It's already five cat stage, stage three. So this femur will get replaced. Uh, it doesn't matter. But the point to show here is that you can see the synovial thickening pretty nicely, all these dots, uh, which is sometimes hidden in those 2D images which look smooth to the eyes. Um, this one is much sharper. You can see this cartilage swelling here, the blister in the bone. Uh, you can see the AVN, you can see the bone marrow edema, and you can see the labral tear. So this basically gives you um, everything you need to see in a hip. And here are the plicae on either side. You can see all the synovial thickening around that plica. And if you go on the axial images down, you can see all of this synovial thickening quite a bit. So sometimes when it's so prominent, you may think a oh, patient has PVNS or something. It's not PVNS, it's just a synovial thickening from chronic irritation and AVN and things like that. So this is how we do the 3D processing of the hip and measure the labral tears and then provide the report to the surgeon. Thank you very much. Okay, so today we saw 3D processing of hip, shoulder and knee. Thanks for joining us. Um, but you should adopt this in your practice as much as possible. If you have a high-end scanner or newer scanners, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, it's anywhere from six to seven minute sequence. and. Um, once you do this kind of sequence, um, you have so many slices to look at and you can't miss labral tears or meniscal tears because it gets fairly easy. In fact, you can measure it. Um, and this is something we are looking at in our practice, you know, how long the labral or meniscal tears is versus how the patient is doing in future. So that's a research will, which will be going for many years um, going forward um, in our research groups. Um, we have hip, knee and shoulder research groups. So we are looking at uh, basically going more detail into the um, soft tissue tears and how well the patients do after they get repaired. Well, thanks for joining and um, hope you apply some of these practices um, in your own practice and help your colleagues. Thank you.